I want to thank Doug Parks for providing this opportunity for me to speak here before you, and I want to thank you for coming out because I have some very, very exciting information that I love to share with everybody. And this information really relates to what controls biology. And as Doug mentioned, I was a uh, cellular biologist uh, at the University of Wisconsin cloning human muscle cells. I was taking cells out of people, putting them into the tissue culture dish, and studying individual cells in an effort to understand what was controlling their fate, what was making them uh, dystrophic or pathological, what was making them normal, and in the control process. In this uh, research, I started to come to an understanding that greatly differed from my whole scientific foundation that we were controlled by genes. And in the end, the research let me in on the inside that it was the perception of the environment that controlled the cell. Well, at cell levels, perceptions are perceptions, but at human levels, perceptions are beliefs. And it turns out that it's actually our beliefs that select our genes and select our behavior. And the beautiful part about this, as Doug said, is it's life-changing for myself especially. I was uh, one of the genetic kind of people, and now I've transitioned my whole life into this so-called new age spiritual um, uh, science of belief. And the wonderful part about this lecture, outside of the fact that I will provide you with a molecular connection of how a belief actually switches on a gene so that there's no like empty boxes, no devotion in this place. This is actually just molecules. I'm going to get that across, I hope. Uh, but the beautiful part about this I, uh, is that in the second part of the presentation, a dear friend and colleague of mine, Rob Williams, is going to provide you with information and tools about how you can rapidly change beliefs. And belief changing is not that hard a process. In fact, it can be done almost in minutes. So there's uh, new science and new tools available. Uh, but before I start, let's get off with a, a true statement. This is a very simple truth statement. Knowledge is power. The more awareness you have, the more capable you are of surviving and succeeding. Well, this is a truth, but there's another truth as well that goes with this picture, and that is lack of knowledge results in a lack of power. Why is this relevant right now? This question about lack of knowledge is this is that we all have been provided with information about our health being involved with our genes. We used to hear the stories, actually we still hear it on a daily newspaper, you might even find an article tonight that talks about the fact that the genes control the aspects of our lives. Well, we also recognize this, that we got the genes from our parents. And when you get genes from your parents and all of a sudden the genes control your life, then you find yourself to be more or less a victim of your heredity. If you find that there's cancer running in your family, then what do you start to get nervous about? My God, I've got genes in here. I'm a ticking time bomb, something is going to go off and I'm going to end up dead or some problem is going to happen. Why? Not my responsibility came from my parents. Well, the problem with that belief system is it extends to another level. It says if you really can't do anything about your genes because that's what you receive from your parents, then all of a sudden you become irresponsible in the sense of like, well, I can't do anything about it, so why should I even try? And that's when all of a sudden all things go lost. And, and this is where this lack of power manifests itself because this belief about genes is totally disempowering to every one of us because it says you are less powerful than your genes. But what about the reality that this is not a true statement? And the fact is, well, let me explain what, I, what I'm talking about here. I'll start off with this. This picture of the DNA, almost everyone has seen this. It's been in school for so many years now. We're all trained with this. We see this on the media every day, that the DNA in your body, the genes in your body, provide for the characteristics of your life. So things not just besides your height, your hair color, your eye color, but things like anxiety and, and obesity and homosexuality and aggression and shyness and happiness are all characteristics that have been attributed to genes. And in this, if this is true, then the belief system, of course, is that when you got these genes at the moment of fertilization, your life was already established and all the rest of your life is just the unfoldment of the programs that you receive from your parents. So the genes, and we're going to talk some science tonight, but it's not going to be that difficult, so bear with me on it, because, I, again, I don't want to leave black boxes in here, empty spaces where you have to have devotion. I'm going to show you the connection. Uh, the genes, the DNA molecules, are found in the cell, in the individual cell, in a structure called the nucleus. So almost all people have seen a cell with a nucleus in it. And virtually all the genes are in the nucleus. As it says right here in this paper, which is in a recent issue of Science, this is one of the most prestigious journals in the world today, it says here in the first sentence on this article, which was dealing with the whole uh, issue dedicated to the role of the nucleus, first sentence, the nucleus is the command center of the cell. 
This is conventional belief, that the nucleus is the command center because in the nucleus are the genes, and the genes control you, so the nucleus represents that source of control for the cell. Well, the command center of the cell would be tantamount to the brain. As I used to teach in medical school to the medical students, the cells, and this is an image of a cell, just a cartoon image of a cell. The cells make us up. We have approximately 50 to 75 trillion cells that make our body. Interesting point I used to teach them is this. There is no new function in your entire human body that's not already present in every cell. Every cell has a respiratory system, a digestive system, an excretory system, an endocrine system, an integumentary system, a nervous system, a reproductive system, an immune system. Basically, what I'm trying to tell you is this that the cell and the human are structural functional counterparts of each other. Whatever is in the cell is in the human. Whatever is in the human is in the cell. So when I talk about the brain of the cell, or the brain of the human, as that element that controls the command center of the human body, when I come over here and just read what we just read off the science journal that said the nucleus is the command center of the cell, this is because all the DNA is in here, then we get the assumption that the nucleus is the brain of the cell which is what you anticipate if it's the command center. Well, that's an interesting concept for this reason. I'll ask you a simple question, and the question is this. If I take the brain out of any living organism, what is the immediate and necessary consequence of that action? Death, absolutely, it's gonna die. So what happens if I go to the cell and take the nucleus out of the cell? Well, if the nucleus is the brain of the cell, by definition, the cell's going to die. Here's the reality. I remove the brain from any organism and the organism dies. But if I go to the nucleus and remove the nucleus from the cell, the cell is totally unaffected by it. A cell can live for two or more months with no genes in it at all. And it's not just sitting there, it's doing everything it was doing before we took the nucleus out. It's moving around, it's, it's communicating with other cells, it's eating, it's growing, it's, it's, it's able to uh, uh, eliminate waste and build up its structure. It recognizes toxins and moves away from them, recognizes food, moves toward that. Basically, what am I telling you? I take all the genes out of the cell and I alter the behavior in no way. Meaning this, by definition, the nucleus cannot be the controlling center of the cell because the cell still has control with no nucleus. Well, wait, I took all the genes out and the cell still has behavior. The bottom line is that the genes do not control biology. This is a mistake. This is an assumption. It was made years and years ago. It was never proven scientifically, but it just seems so correct that we bought the story. And in fact, the cosmic joke just hit us not very long ago with the outcome of the Human Genome Project. Why was it a joke? And I'll tell you this. If the mechanism worked according to the way it's written in the textbooks that the genes control biology, then there's the requirement that there has to be at least 120,000 genes to make a human. When the Human Genome Project's results were turned in, it turned out that there were only less than 35,000 genes. Over 90,000 genes are not present, which means this. It's not that the genes are absent. Our belief system was wrong. The genes do not control biology like we thought. So the Human Genome Project really pulls the rug out because they thought they were going to get the blueprint of how to make a human with all of these genes. And it turns out there are not that many genes. Two-thirds of the genes are missing, meaning we have to now understand a new way of looking at biology. Interestingly enough, though, the new understanding actually started to come out in the last 10 years. So everything I'm going to talk to you about tonight is science within the last 10 years. And the interesting part about it is this. It takes at least 10 or 15 years for science to take a fact from its first inception to get it out into the public so that the people can understand it. So anything in a textbook, for example, is at least 10 or 15 years old. So what you're going to hear tonight is the future textbook. You're going to know the science that has just been released in the last 10 years. And I'm going to talk about this amazing structure, the human cell, and how it works. And I also told you that the cell and you have the same functions. Where you have an organ in your body, the cell has organelles that carry out the same function. So that this is a respiratory and digestive system. These are all structures in the cell. And the issue is, what we really want to find out is, where's the brain of the cell? Because up to just a few minutes ago, the conventional belief is the brain of the cell are the genes. But if I take all the genes out and the brain is still functioning, 
we have to look for an alternative understanding of how the cell works. So I'm going to start off and give you some very basic insight into the mechanism of how cells work, okay? And cells are very interesting. They're like machines. This is a, an example of a transmission out of my car. And what you can see, it's called a, an exploded diagram because you can see all these intricate little parts that all come together and assemble together to make a functional car transmission. Well, the point about it is this. The cell is analogous to this for the following reason. The cell is actually a machine made out of parts, but the parts are proteins, not metal parts and gears like this. The cells are made out of protein parts. There's approximately 70,000 protein parts. So when you open up a cell and you start to take it out, you can start to find that the building blocks are proteins. This becomes very important because what I want you to understand is when you look in the mirror and see yourself, when you, when you uh, say, uh, you know, brown hair, blue eyes, such a height, all of that is due to the protein. The protein provides you with your structure. And so the assembly of these parts. And the interesting part, thing about these machine parts is this. I can do a lot of the functions in a test tube. I can do digestion in a test tube. All I have to do is take the right enzymes, the proteins for digestion, put it in a test tube, it'll do digestion. I can do muscle contraction. I can take the actin and myosin, which are the contractile proteins, put them in a test tube and make them contract in front of your eyes. I can do respiration in a test tube. What I'm saying again, the cell is a machine. It's made out of parts. The parts interact with each other to create the complex thing we call life. Well, let's talk about the parts. As I said, there were 70 to 90,000 different protein parts that make up the human. Now, here's the interesting understanding about these parts. Of all the proteins, all of them are linear strings, just like this beaded string. Every protein is a beaded string. The beads or the, the subunits, the little beads, are called amino acids. So when you go to the health food store and you're talking about buying amino acids, what are you buying? You're buying the little building blocks to make the protein. So what makes the difference between 70 to 90,000 different proteins? And the answer is this. First, they're all strings, as I said, so that's already a commonality. What's the difference? Two things. The length of the chain, how many amino acids are in the string, is variable from one protein to the next. And number two, and most importantly, the sequence of the colors which represent the different amino acids rep are making the characteristic of the protein. Now, it's hard for you to see how you get structure out of something that looks like a string of beads. So instead of beads, I'm going to use these as representatives of beads. These are little pipe fittings. I have three different, actually, shapes of pipe fittings. A 45-degree angle pipe fitting a 90 degree angle pipe fitting, and a straight one. So three variations, and consider there are 20 different variations, I'm only showing you three. So here's the point. If I start to assemble these pipe fittings in a sequence, what you can start to see is I am creating a linear chain, but now it's not so flexible and floppy. It actually has a rigid backbone kind of structure to it. So as I start to assemble this, you can see I can create a structure, okay? But here's what I told you. What did I tell you about what was making the difference between the proteins? The sequence and the length of the chain. So look, what if I take this apart and reassemble the sequence of amino acids in a different sequence? You think I'm going to get the same shape? So let's take it apart and we'll take a look at it and see what happens. So the point about it is this. You assemble the amino acids, you put them in a sequence, and the sequence determines what's going to happen. So I take the same amino acids. Plug, plug them in now in a sequence, but a different sequence than just we had a second ago. And as I do this, you can see the shape of this protein is not the same as it was the first time. Is that evident? Is that, can, can you see that? Is that? I want everybody to understand it. Why is this important? What's the point? The parts of the proteins have structure due to the sequence of these amino acids. Okay? Number two, how can I get 70,000 different parts? And the answer is this by creating a chain with a different sequence of amino acids for each different protein. So you saw that, right? So now the bottom line is this. I have this particular protein, and if I just made a body out of protein only, and that's all it was, then I would be a statue. Instead of made out of brass or bronze, I'd be a statue made out of organic building blocks called a protein. There's no life. Where does the life come from? That is the most important, exciting question. I made a machine out of protein, but what is life? Life is animation. Life is movement. And so therefore, where's the movement come from? Now I'm going to show you that. <laughs> and it's simple because this is the ultimate understanding of where life comes from. When I assembled these together, I connected them like poppet beats, but look, they twist. 
because at the junction, they're, they're not locked, so I can change the shape of this protein. I just made this one, okay? Now I'm gonna show you something. Let me show you two different shapes. And before I do that, I'm gonna give you a, a little uh, piece of information. The yellow ones at the end are gonna be negatively charged. Both of them are negative. Why is this important? We'll go back to a very basic principle of science. When two like charges come against each other, what do they do? They repel each other. And two opposite charges, what do they do? Attract. So I'm going to show you two different shapes of the same protein by just twisting it. And I'm going to ask you to tell me which is the more stable of the two, OK? Let's use this as shape one, OK? Now I'm going to show you shape two. And then I want you to tell me which is more stable, shape one or shape two? Shape two. And the reason why? Because the two negative charges repel each other. They want to get as far away from each other as they can. So does this make sense that this is a stable shape for this protein? OK, cool. Now, I have this protein in your body. And I said that this was negative at the end. And this is an environmental signal. And I'm going to talk about environmental signals. Signals are either other molecules or atoms or energy. Energy can be signals as well. But in this case, let's say it's a molecule. Let's say it's estrogen, a hormone. And let's just say that it's very positively charged. What's the charge on here? Negative. A negative? OK, so if this is coming along and this is positive, what happens when two opposite charges come near each other? So all of a sudden, you're going to find that there's a binding. Where the, this is where the estrogen binds to the protein. Now, this is more positive than, than this negative. So the question is this. What's the charge at this end of the molecule now? Positive. positive. What's the charge at this one? Now, the question is very simple. Is this shape of the molecule stable, or is this one more stable? Uh, now, that, this is so fundamental. I want you to understand how critical this is. You understood that there was a shape, that if I have this molecule on, let's say I take this molecule off, what's the shape going to do? It's going to open back up like this, right? And then if I put the molecule back on, what's the shape going to do? Close. Well, you, you just told me there were two shapes that were stable, and the difference is when I add the signal, I go from one shape to the other. Does that make sense? Well, that is where life comes from. Life is movement of the proteins. The proteins move, and when they change shape, they can do jobs. So if I have work, I can have this thing do a job. By opening and closing, that would be its job. So you can say, well, what kind of jobs are just like simple movements? I'll give you a simple one. Let's say I'm a protein, and that this is the signal molecule, and I stand like this, and when the signal molecule hits in my hand, I go like that, and I let go of the signal. What happens if I let go of the signal? What's going to happen? I'm going to go back. And then another signal comes in my hand. Then what am I going to do? Go like this. And you say, well, that's a nice simple movement, but what does that have to do with it? Well, if your house is on fire, and you have a bucket brigade, and I'm a protein in the middle, and somebody hands me the bucket, what am I going to do? Pick it from here and pass it to the other guy. Well, the point about it is very simply this. Proteins provide for my physical structure, but proteins can change shape when a signal binds to that protein. So all of a sudden it says that a static protein could just be sitting here, but the moment the signal shows up, the protein does something. Well, that something is hooked or actually used to do a job in the cell. So what is digestion? Here's an enzyme. It stands here. Here's the food molecule, and it gets caught in my hand, and I bring it together, and I rip it apart. That's all it is, ripping apart, digestion. So the bottom line is this. You're a machine. The structure of the machine is due to the protein parts. The proteins are all these linear chains made out of amino acids, that the final structure is due to the sequence of the amino acids and the charge. That's this critical part. When I balance the charge, the protein is stable. If I change the charge, the protein changes its shape. It's simple, but it's very basic science, OK? And here's the point about it is this, is that uh, and this is interesting because this is a uh, right out of the science uh, journal. And this is backbone here, this protein in green, is the same one that's in yellow. And in this case, this is a protein that causes muscle contraction in your body. And it depends on this signal. The signal is calcium. When calcium shows up, it plugs into the hole. It changes the charge. And it causes the protein to change its shape from this inactive form, conformation one, shape one, when I add the signal, it goes to shape two, the active form. If I take the signal away, 
then the protein goes back to the resting state. So there are two different shapes to the protein, an active and an inactive form, and the activity is now controlled by the signal. So basically it says that proteins provide for your physical structure, but proteins also provide for your behavior. Your behavior is the movement, the actions that you express in your life, and the movement comes from the movement of protein. So basically it says this, your behavior represents the action of a protein that interacts with a signal. And so that the signal activates the protein to move and the movement generates behavior. Well, why this is important then, it says this, if I have just the protein and no signal, what happens? Nothing. So then action is really by what? Controlling the signal. So here's the point. The brain of the cell is the structure that controls the signals to tell the cell what to do in response to the environment. So we want to understand the brain of the cell uh, because there's a very limited time. And uh, over the weekend when I have 12 hours or so to talk about it, I can expand on it. But in a very brief moment, the brain of the cell is the skin of the cell, the membrane. It's the same as your skin. And you might say to yourself, well, what do you mean, the skin and the brain, that they look like two different things? And the answer is this. In embryology, there are germ layers. There are three germ layers that create the ultimate full-size organism. The germ layers are called ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. They're layers of cells. Each layer gives rise to different organs and tissues. Interesting, the outer layer called the ectoderm only gives rise to two things in the human body, skin, and the brain and nervous system. Your brain is derived from your skin. And it makes sense as to why, because I'll show you, the skin is the interface between the environment and the cytoplasm. The skin can read what's going on and then tell the proteins in the cell what to do. I told you I could take the nucleus out of the cell and didn't change the behavior. And the reason why is the nucleus is not the brain of the cell. The nucleus is the gonad of the cell. It's reproduction. If I need a part, to make the cell work, then the nucleus is like the Butterick pattern drawer. It's got all the patterns to make 70,000 different parts in your body, but the nucleus doesn't know which one need is needed at which time. The nucleus has no intelligence. The nucleus is just the repository for the pattern. So if I take the nucleus out of the cell, I didn't change anything about the cell. The cell will die after a while for the following reason the proteins that make up the machinery break down and wear out. And if they break down, I got to replace them, otherwise I die. So I need the nucleus not for the intelligence, I only need the nucleus for the blueprint. So there's no brain involved with genes. Genes are not capable of that. How does the cell membrane work? It takes an environmental signal, and it could be anything. It could be sunshine, it could be hot air, it could be sound, it could be anything that's out there, chemicals, smells, taste, anything that's from the environment, the membrane picks that up and the, the environmental signal is called the primary signal. And then what happens then is this, the membrane converts the environmental signal into the signal that controls the protein so that the behavior is mediated by the cell membrane as it responds to the environment. The behavior, if I cut off the environment, the cell has no behavior. Your cell with all the components in it, if I could cut off the environment from the cell, it will just sit there. It has no life. Life is due to how the cell responds to the environment. Your life is how you respond to your environment. As you see the environment, as you walk out of here, those are environmental signals. They actually run your proteins and make you behave. So your behavior is not due to the genes. We didn't even bring DNA in yet. Your behavior is due to how you see the signal, which is called perception, and then convert that signal into selecting the right proteins for your responses, okay? So now the issue is how does this membrane work? Well, that's the beautiful part. It's relatively simple. Let me explain it. If we look at some cells growing on a Petri dish, and we look at the skin of the cells, it's all bubbly looking, but at a higher magnification, this is what it looks like. At higher magnification, the skin is like a sandwich. It looks like a bread and butter sandwich, and there's this lipid layer right in the middle, and it's the oil that makes the skin a barrier because the water in the environment can't go through the membrane, and the water inside the cell can't go through the membrane. So in, under the skin, there's a protected environment of which all the mechanisms can work. To show you the reality of it, this is an electron microscope picture of the actual cell membrane. You see the dark light, dark layer of the cell membrane? 
it really represents the layer of these molecules that look like this, okay? Dark, light, dark, so that the model and the image of the real picture are very much exactly the same thing. But this membrane isn't functional because I left out the most important part of the membrane. It's the proteins, the proteins that we were talking about that are capable of responding to the signal and, and then activating a behavior. So when I look at the surface of the cell, Actually, instead of being smooth, there are all these structures like antennas sticking up all over the surface and proteins built into the membrane. And that these proteins read the environment and convert that environmental signal into a behavior. Let me explain how it works. Here's the membrane. Here are two different proteins. I'm going to tell you right now, there are thousands and thousands of proteins in the cell membrane, but I can divide them into two groups. Two groups. One group has antennas on it. And antennas are receivers, just like your television antenna uh, for on top of your house when you, before cable, when you had an antenna on the top. What was its function? To pick up a signal. And then what happened to that signal? It was transmitted down the wire to the television, and the television converted the signal into something you could see. Well, here's the point. Many of the receptors in the cell are, have, have these antennas sticking up from the cell. So if I go back, these are the antennas sticking up from the surface of the cell right here. And what they're tuned to are not television stations, they're tuned to environmental information. It might be glucose, for example, is there sugar out there? Or histamine, is there histamine out there which tells me to get ready for an emergency response? Or is there something like insulin which tells me to change my metabolic pathway? For every different thing the cell can see, it has a different antenna. So that means the cells are covered over the surface with antennas for everything the cell can deal with. So the signals come in and picked up by the antenna, but then they're converted into the behavior by the second class of proteins. There are three different kinds channels, which are just like olives with a hole in the middle of them where information can go in, enzymes, which are proteins that cause metabolism to occur, or cytoskeletal proteins, proteins that change the shape of the cell. So if a signal comes in, let's say a toxic signal comes in, uh, and this is a receiver for that, and it couples to the skeleton, it says, it's a toxic signal, turn around and start running the other way, then this is the input and this is the output. So the proteins work in combination. Receptors receive signals. Do you have receptors? Yeah. What are the obvious ones? Eyes, ears, nose, taste, touch. Where are all your receptors located? In the skin. So you and the cell are parallels, but it doesn't look like an eye and it doesn't look like a nose, but its function is exactly the same. It's the equivalent of an eye. If this was tuned to light, a photon of light would hit this antenna and that cell would respond like an eye and say, I see the light. And once it sees the light, it has to convert that information and it uses it by connecting to this. And I'm going to show you how that happens. So the input, the antenna, connects to the output, which makes the behavior. Let me explain how it works. So we'll use this model right here of a, um, of a uh, receptor. Uh, let's see. This receptor is going to, uh, uh, I'm going to show it to you in dynamic motion. Here's my membrane, bread and butter sandwich. Here's my antenna. And this is the antenna scouring the environment for a signal. Look at the shape because the protein goes into the cell. Look at the shape. What happens when a cell, when a protein binds to a signal? Changes shape. Well, watch what happens. See, when the signal came in, and watch what happens when the signal goes away. Did you, should, I, should I do that one more time so you can see that? Okay, basically it says this, is that the proteins are in the cell, that these receptors are migrating through the surface of the, of the cell. This, okay, here it is. Are you going to come start moving soon? Okay, <laughs> here's the protein. It's scanning the environment, looking for signals. And let's say it's an insulin receptor. If there's insulin, I would activate the receptor. But look, no activation of the receptor. There's no change in shape. But when the insulin shows up, I change the shape. That, so if I'm inside the cell, if we were inside the cell and these proteins were hanging down from the, from the ceiling, would you be able to tell if insulin was here or not by the shape of the protein? Yeah. yeah. So if you're inside the cell, you can tell what's going on outside. Okay. Now the next thing is this. After I, I receive a signal, I actually have to send a secondary signal into the cell to activate the behavior of the cell. So in this case, I'm going to use a channel, which is like an olive. And what happens is this. This protein moves around through the membrane. See, it's closed at the top. Nothing can get through. But when it opens, it makes a channel where signal molecules can shoot inside the cell. And the bottom line is this. The only thing that can go through this channel is what fits. If the molecule doesn't fit, 
it doesn't go through the channel. So basically it says this, in the resting state, the protein is closed. But when activated, the protein opens, and when it opens, it allows signals to go into the cell and coordinate the behavior of the cell. So now that we've looked at that, let's put the two together and then show you what is this, this mechanism that controls biology. The two together, the input and the output. This is looking for the environmental signal, and this is going to convert that signal into behavior. This is the connector. Look at the shape. Does it fit here, yes or no? Okay, so that means no signal is present. So nothing's, no behavior. But when the signal shows up, I change the shape. When the shape is changed, then I connect it, open this one up, and see this? This is the signal that tells the cell to do something, and it's going to do whatever is connected to that. So the bottom line is the behavior of the cell is controlled by the input of the environment, and then the conversion of that input into a behavior signal that coordinates the function of the cell to respond to what's going on in the environment. Interesting point. If I cut the antenna off the cell so it cannot see anything, there's no behavior. The cell is totally comatose. It'll sit there, and what does that mean? It says then behavior is related to the signal. If there's no signal, there's no behavior. So it's like reflex, stimulus, response. The, the signal is the stimulus, and then the cell creates a response. So basically it goes like this. The receptor is the input. It reads the environment. The receptor then connects to the effector, which generates the behavior through a secondary signal. The primary signal, this is the secondary signal that activates the behavior of the cell. So that this unit is controlling a specific aspect of behavior. But there's like thousands of these different kinds of units simultaneously. So this is an example of just a switch. It's a switch. When insulin shows up, switch on metabolism. When histamine shows up, switch on protection. So there's each, for each different thing that's out in the environment, there's a switch that will activate the behavior of the cell. So basically, did, did you understand that as a switch, input, output? Well, then look at it this way. The function of the receptor is awareness of the environment, right? It sees. But I have to convert that signal into a biological action. So the function of the output guy, the effector, is to create a physical sensation or response to that signal. Is that understandable so far? Why is this important? Go back and ask, the first step is this. What does this do? What does it do? It controls a typical behavior in response to the signal. Well, what is this called? Well, it represents awareness of the environment through physical sensation. So what is this control unit actually called? Perception. Perception, awareness of the environment through physical sensation. So if I go back a second, I say, what is the function of this? And the answer is this. It's perception. It sees the environment and activates a behavior. There's no DNA involved. There's no genes involved. All we're talking about is stimulus response. Stimulus comes in the receptor, response made by the effector. Okay? So the point about it is this simple first conclusion. It's very basic. Behavior, which is movement, this is behavior, <laughs> movement of protein is controlled by the signal, but via perception. So the bottom line is this, perception controls behavior. If there is no perception, there's no behavior. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, well that's number one. We didn't have genes involved yet. So let's just see how this actually works. So basically, here are proteins in the cell. Let's say that these proteins carry out a specific function, respiration or digestion. We call it a pathway. So let's say it's a muscle contraction. That these proteins, when activated, what, will, what activates the protein? The signal activates the protein. So what we're going to do is convert an environmental signal using the receptor and the effector. And this time I'm using an enzyme. Okay, and what I'm going to show you is how the mechanism from the environment, the signal, well, here's my connector one, remember the green guy? But now the signal comes, and when the signal from the environment binds to the receptor, it changes the shape or confirmation of the receptor, which implies that the signal is there. So the protein informs the cell that something has happened. Now that that shape has changed, this processor protein, the green one, can bind to the shape because it wasn't able to bind before. It wasn't the right shape. It's like dominoes, one hitting the next. Now that the processor protein is bound to the receptor, it changes its shape and will conform to fit the, en the enzyme. So one domino hits the next, hits the next. 
now that this is connected, I activate the enzyme, and the enzyme is going to create a signal. Now, here's, here's the connection between my muscle of the proteins and the receptor. This is the secondary signal. Remember, primary signal and secondary signal. Well, at first, it's bound and covered up and inhibited because if there's no signal, I don't want it to do anything. But when the signal shows up, then I take the enzyme, split it, and the active component, now this is the active signal, can bind to the protein. And now I can activate this protein. And this is the behavior that's going to be expressed by the cell. And the question, of course, is, well, what really activated this protein? What was the original source? The answer is the primary signal at the environment was then relayed by the secondary signal to activate the behavior of the cell. So without all the labels, if we just quickly look at it, uh, let's just go right through it real fast. And the point about it is this, uh, let's see, that uh, here's the environmental signal, here's the, the receptor, the effector, that's the perception unit. Perception is now being started because it saw the environment, changed the shape, activates the enzyme. The enzyme is activated, breaks that molecule, the signal molecule, the signal molecule comes down, binds to the protein, and generates behavior. The bottom line was this, the behavior of the cell is not programmed, the behavior of the cell is continuously adjusting to whatever the signals are in the environment. So now I got another question to ask you. What happens if that environmental signal shows up, but I don't have the proteins necessary in the cell right now for that event? So when it shows up, it says, oh, I can't make a response, I don't have the behavioral proteins. Where do we get the behavioral proteins? Now we bring the DNA back in. What's the role of the DNA? The DNA double helix actually is a blueprint of the protein. If I separate the helix into, each, into two separate strands, and you look at the, these, these are called bases, these are the steps of the double helix right here, the color sequence in the DNA codes for the sequence of the amino acids. So for every three bases, I can tell you which is the next amino acid. So the point is this, the plan of how to make a protein, a specific protein, is built into this DNA. So that every three bases say, oh, put in tryptamine, okay, put in proline, next one put in alanine, whatever it is. So the sequence, the DNA is a blueprint for the protein. Okay? That's all it is. It doesn't have any action except when I need it. So how do I activate the gene? Well, this is, you heard of cancer genes? And you say, what is that, a gene that gives you cancer? And the answer is, here's a simple truth. Genes do not self-activate. That's biochemically a truth, meaning a gene cannot turn itself on and a gene cannot turn itself off. If you want a gene to be active, it's not up to the gene. So the concept that there's a cancer gene is a false concept, meaning this. If the gene really caused cancer and you were in possession of that gene, when would you express the cancer? You would express it by the time you were born because as soon as the cells started to divide, the cancer gene would say, okay, time to make cancer. So how can you have so-called cancer gene for 30 or 40 years sitting in your body and you don't have cancer and then you get cancer? Should I go back and say the gene caused that? And the answer is no. In this paper by Niehaut, Metaphors in the Role of Genes in Development, he, play, he played it out in this true, truth, a simple statement of truth that I'm going to show you because I want to use his paper because the statement is so perfect. But the fact is this, what did he say? He said this, for 50 years, we have believed that genes are in control. We've been repeating it and saying it over and over again for 50 years so that it's part of every textbook. And the bottom line was, that was never a scientific reality. It was never scientifically established that genes control anything. It's not true. What is the truth? Well, the answer is this. The first thing, conventional belief, genes control biology, is totally false. Why? Genes can't turn themselves on. Genes can't turn themselves off. How are they going to control anything? They can't control themselves. So bottom line is the genes aren't in charge. So the question is, if I need a gene to be activated, and what would, why would a gene be activated? To make the proteins for the cell that needs to do the behavior. So the truth statement is this. When a gene product is needed, a signal from its environment, not an emergent property of the gene itself, activates expression of the gene. Well, that's somewhat of a complicated sentence, so let's simplify it. Just read line two and line four. And if we read that, it says, 
A signal from its environment activates expression of the gene. What does that mean? The genes in your body are selected not because they are self-selecting. The genes are always selected in response to the environment that you're in. So if you had that cancer gene and for 35 years, let's say, you stood around saying, hey, I don't have cancer, and all of a sudden cancer happened, are we going to go to the gene and blame the gene, or what would we actually look for as responsible if you understand the true statement? The signal from the environment. What change in your life promoted activation of the gene that was sitting dormant for 35 years? Ah, we've been focusing on the gene all the time. The point is we have to start focusing on the signals. The signals do this. Well, let me explain how this happens. When we look at a cell nucleus, this is where the chromosomes and the DNA is. I can stain the chromosomes and you break open the nucleus, you can see all these different chromosomes. You have 23 pairs of chromosomes to make a human. They're called pairs of chromosomes because you get 23 chromosomes from your mother, 23 chromosomes from your father, and they're matched pairs. So, in fact, even I can see that one of these is from the mother and one of these is from the father because you can color code them. Well, that's a nice, interesting experiment, but the question is this, what am I staining? I'm not staining DNA. So what's in the nucleus? And the answer is this, 50% of the nucleus is DNA and 50% is protein. And the reason why we have a problem here is this, for 50 years, everyone was so focusing on the genes that when they wanted to study the DNA, what did they do? They'd go find a nucleus from the cell, they'd break it open, expose all the chromosomes, and you know what they do? Separate the protein from the DNA and then throw away the protein. And for 50 years, they've thrown away the protein in their focus on studying DNA. And now, all of a sudden, in the last few years, the question is, hey, what have we been throwing away? And the answer is the control. They, for 50 years, they've thrown the control away, what controls the genes, and studied pure DNA. There is no such thing as pure DNA in any organism. The DNA is always associated with the protein. So what's the function of the protein? Look how simple this is. The protein forms a sleeve around the DNA. So let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Imagine my bare arm is a gene. Let's say it's the gene for blue eyes. And I say, okay, can you read the gene for blue eyes, yes or no? Yes. yes. Okay, but all of a sudden, well, what does the DNA look like when I put it back in the nucleus? Put the sleeve of protein on it. Can you read the gene for, for blue eyes, yes or no? no? If you want to read the gene for blue eyes, what do you have to do? Take the sleeve off. Well, the sleeve is protein. How does a sleeve come off? Here's the protein, and it's locked onto my arm. If you can remember back about 15 minutes ago, what is it that will cause the change in the shape of the protein? Ah, so when I add the signal from the environment, all of a sudden, then what happens is this. The protein changes shape, pulls away from the DNA. Now I can read the gene, and when the signal is removed, the protein will come back and cover up the sleeve again. So the bottom line was this. The gene was just sitting there all the time. It's whether the proteins are present or absent. So if I look at it this way, then we understand this. I said you were made out of protein. The understanding is that DNA is the blueprint for the protein. In conventional textbooks, because they've thrown away the protein for 50 years, they don't talk about this. Conventional talks about the DNA goes to the RNA, which is a, like a Xerox copy of the DNA, and the RNA is then turned into the protein. And then they talk about the primacy of DNA. That's what's in all the textbooks. You are a re result of your DNA but they've thrown away the protein. So when we put it back in, it says, ah, the protein covers up the DNA. The protein is a sleeve. But to take the sleeve off, you actually have to have the environmental signal. So remember what Niehaus' quote was? A signal from the environment activates the expression of the DNA. So the bottom line right here is this. The environmental signal comes in and changes the shape of the regulatory protein, which removes the sleeve, exposes the DNA, and then I can make my proteins. So rather than the primacy of DNA, which is conventional thought, it's actually the primacy of the environment. It's the environment that selects your genes, not the genes themselves. So if I wanted to illustrate it, let's go back to our picture of how the cell worked. What I showed you was this. 
The signal from the environment activated the receptor, which activated the effector, and the effector activated the secondary signal to go down to the protein. Remember that picture just a minute ago? Well, here's the point. In this illustration, the protein's not there. And if I need the protein because the environmental signal, I have to respond to the signal, and the protein's not there, what would I need to do if the protein's not present in the cell? Go to the nucleus and activate the gene for the making of the protein, right? So let's watch the behavior of this as it happens. So basically what's going to happen is this. The environmental signal joins to the receptor, activates this whole process so that I activate this, but look, the signal goes down, the proteins are missing. If the proteins are missing, I need the proteins to make the, the proper response, but they're not there. So what I have to do then is take this signal and go into the nucleus of the cell where the DNA is. But the DNA is covered up by a sleeve of protein. And at periodic points, at every gene, there's a control protein called a regulatory protein. And you know what happens? The signal from the environment binds to the right gene by the shape. It doesn't bind to this one, wrong shape. Binds to this one. Now what happens when a signal binds to a protein? Changes the shape of the protein. And watch what happens. As soon as I change the shape of the protein, I cause the sleeve to come off the DNA. And when it happens, look what I'm exposing. The gene is now exposed. And what am I going to do with this? Well, I need to make a copy of the gene called RNA, which then goes into the cell where it's turned into the protein. So the bottom line is, then I take the RNA molecule, make a copy of this DNA molecule, and then this is a blueprint of the gene and this is called RNA, messenger RNA, and this blueprint is actually used to make the protein. So what's the understanding about this whole process? It says this, the gene is not exposed until the signal calls it into play. When the signal is gone, the sleeve covers it up and the gene is now hidden. If this is a cancer gene and it's not giving you cancer because it's not exposed, what will cause the cancer gene to express itself? The signal. So all of a sudden it says, then what signals from your environment are you perceiving that you are selecting negative genes or processes in your body? And all of a sudden we start to say, so let's do the same thing now without all the labels, real fast. The secondary signal goes down, the protein's missing. The secondary signal goes into the nucleus, finds the right gene by binding to the right regulatory protein, causing the regulatory protein sleeve to come off, exposing the gene. And once the gene's exposed, I make a copy of it called RNA, and this is what goes out into the cell and is used for the function and behavior of the cell. So what is the conclusion of all of this? And the answer is simply this. Perception controls genes. Understand? The genes did not control themselves. The perception was the signal that converted the, the sleeve of the, the DNA to come off. So the bottom line is perception not only controls behavior, but perception will actually go in and select which genes you're going to express. Now here comes the third part. The first part, perception controlled behavior because the protein was there. The second part, the signal shows up and the protein's not there, so the perception signal goes to the genes and activates the appropriate gene. Here's the third part. What happens if I run into a stressful environment and I don't have the appropriate genes to respond to that stress? Well, then you just have to say, well, the only way you're going to manage is to change the genes. Well, in conventional biology, the only way the genes change is a process called random mutation. This is in all the textbooks. What does it mean? It says this. I can chemically cause a mutation to occur, but what I can't control is the outcome. The outcome is always random. So the bottom line is that's where Darwinian belief comes in, that evolution was random changes in the genes, that genes are only changing by accident. That's conventional belief. Except 1988, this paper comes out in Nature by a man called John Cairns, and it changes the entire foundation of biology that we've ever held for the following reason. He tells us about a new kind of mutation called an adaptive mutation. The point about this mutation that the genes are not changing randomly, but the environment is controlling the mutation so that you're always adjusting your genes to fit what you see in the environment. And so that it's not random, it's environmentally directed mutations. Well, 
Recently, this is a paper that just came out within the last year. The other one was 1988. This is a very interesting paper because what they showed was this. You can take a population of bacteria, put it into five test tubes, and put the same but very stressful environment into each of the test tubes, causing the bacteria to change their genes to survive. Here's the point. In each of the five test tubes, the result was exactly the same. Well, then all of a sudden it says, where's the random nature of that process? And the answer is not random. Evolutionary changes are always adapting to the environment. These miniature adaptive radiations unfold in the same way every time, governed by the available environmental niches. Here's the point. We adjust our genes to fit the environment that we think we live in. And I say we think we live in because perception may be right and perception may be wrong. And therefore, perception is belief. And if this is true, do you understand what this means? It's belief that changes your genes. It's your perception that changes your genes. It's not an accident. And so this chart out of science, which is about Cairns' work about genetic changing, uh, I, cha I, I marked this one with an asterisk because when this article came out, this box was called Genes of DNA Metabolism. There's now a new name for that. It's now, f they're called genetic engineering genes. What this means is this. We have now found out that in every one of your cells, you have genes whose function it is to rewrite the other genes when necessary. So you are all equipped with an ability to adapt and change your genes as you respond to the environment. So all of a sudden it says this, the environment, watch where the arrow goes, the environmental signals activate genetic engineering genes. They can change your own genes and change your genotype. But this one, organisms' perception of the environment separate from the environment, why? because perception and environment may be two different things. I might say, I live in a toxic, hostile environment, but that might be my belief. I might be in a very supportive environment. So it says, my perception may differ from the reality of the environment, but n nonetheless, what does perception do? Follow the blue arrow, activates genetic engineering genes. Your own beliefs are selecting your genes. And if you don't have the right genes to handle the stress that you're in, your belief will rewrite your genes in an effort to do so. So all of a sudden it says, there's a lot of control over your life, but it's mediated by the perception of the environment. That's what's controlling the whole thing. So our third conclusion is, not only does the perception activate behavior, not only does the perception activate the genes, but when necessary, perception rewrites genes. So what's the conclusion? Are you genetically controlled? Are you at the behest of your uh, heredity? Are you a victim? Absolutely not. Why? Because by adjusting your perception, you can adjust your behavior. By adjusting your perception, you can select different genes in your function. By adjusting your perception, you can rewrite your genes. Now, I wouldn't want you to rewrite your genes because 95% of us got here with very appropriate genes to survive and have a great life. Here's the problem. Almost always, when you rewrite your genes, you do a negative process because your genes were already working. And so lots of illnesses and things like cancer, 95% of cancer has no hereditary linkage. 95% of cancer is actively produced by an individual's perception rewriting their normal genes and making cancer genes. All of a sudden, it's, unfortunately, remember when I told you when you were a victim of your heredity, you could be irresponsible because the genes just came that way. If you understand what I'm talking about, then all of a sudden you say, oh my goodness, then how I see things, how I believe things are going on become important. The answer is, huh, well, if you think your behavior or the selection of your genes or the rewriting of your genes is important, then the answer is yes, because all of these are connected to belief because perception in humans is related to belief. So you have the ability to change anything in your body. Unfortunately, if you got here healthy and you change it, that usually means you're making it less uh, uh, effective as a living organism. So the bottom line is this, the perception of the environment, your nervous system sees the environment and interprets it. So here's the real environment, here are the cells. Interestingly enough, if I would take dystrophic patients and take muscle cells out of their body, in many cases when I took the cells out of the body and put it into a good environment, the cells grew beautifully and, and grew healthy and well. But when they were in the body, they didn't. Why? 
because somewhere between the environment and the cell, the perception got involved with it. So our beliefs are altering our biology at every moment, at every time, okay? So the question is, what kind of beliefs and genes am I affecting? Here's this beautiful but very important, simple understanding. The genes in your cell are the equivalent of programs in a disk, in a computer, okay? And the bottom line about it is this. What kind of programs then are in your body? And the answer is simply this. There are two classes of programs. One class is for growth and reproduction, which is a form of growth, and the other is for protection. So that the bottom line is this. When you walk into the environment, you're either going to select growth programs or you're going to select protection programs. And I'm going to explain why it's an either or. I'll give you a simple understanding. I put a, pe a cell in a petri dish. And in one petri dish, I put nutrients here in front of the cell. In a, another petri dish, I put toxins in front of the cell. And then I wait for a period of time. What's going to happen? The answer is this. Cells always move toward signals, nutrients or whatever, positive signals, because positive signals encourage growth. On the other hand, when a cell was confronted with a toxin, toxins threaten survival. So what does a cell do? It doesn't move to the toxin. What does it do? It moves away. And therefore, cells always move away from negative signals. Why is that important? If I'm a cell and there's toxins, there's food here, I'm going to move this way. If I'm a cell and there's toxins, I'm going to move this way. Can a cell move forwards and backwards at the same time? And the answer is no. Why is that relevant? And the answer is simply this. When confronted with an environmental signal, the cells have to make a decision to be in growth or to be in protection. Why is that relevant? Because when the cell is in protection, it stops growing. And the more protection we think we need, the more we shut off our growth mechanisms, and therefore we start stymieing our own health. Let me give you an example. Cells move toward positive signals as a mode of growth. Cells move away from negative signals as a means of protection. There are some signals that the cell doesn't even care about because it doesn't bother its growth or its protection. So there's some signals the cell doesn't really care, so there's zero. So the bottom line is this, cells are either moving in growth or cells are moving in protection, but they can't do both at the same time. That's an individual cell, but I said you were made out of 50 to 75 trillion cells, so when I look at a human, I have a graded scale. You are either in some degree of growth or you're in some degree of protection based on the signals. Here's the interesting aspect. The most important growth promoting signal in the world today for a human is love. It exceeds nutrition. A child getting love will grow. A child not getting love will be stymied in its growth. For example, in Eastern European orphanages where kids are given a lot of nutrition but no attention, their growth parameters, their intelligence, their height, every aspect of their development is reduced by 30% or more, most of them becoming autistic. What is an autistic child? Think about it. An autistic child is not responding to the environment. Why not? Because somewhere in its development, it started to put up the walls of protection because it wasn't getting love. And at some point, it shuts itself down and is no longer responding to the environment that is the highest form of protection. But look what happens to the child. It will die from the process. And the issue is this. When you are in fear, you're shutting down your growth mechanisms. When you're in love, you're enhancing your growth mechanisms. And it's as simple as that. It's a dual strip, one way or the other way. And there's a mechanism for it. In your system, it's called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. The hypothalamus is the portion of the brain that gauges the signals. When the environmental signals come into the mind, the mind says, is that positive or is that a negative signal? It has to know. And the idea is this. If it's a negative signal, then what's going to happen is the stress is going to activate the pituitary gland. Re remember the word pituitary gland in basic, basic education? It was called the master gland. Why? Because the pituitary gland is going to control the shape of the body. So there's two shapes, growth or protection. In negative signals, what ultimately happens is this. Is that, oops, excuse me. In negative signals, what happens is this that the stress activates the pituitary gland to get into fight or flight. Remember fight or flight? Here's the issue. I have two parts of my body. 
I can sub subdivide for you right now. This area has all the organs in it. This is the viscera. What do you think the function of the viscera is? Growth. Growth. This is the muscles and the bones, support. What else is it for? Protection. So here's the point. When I get into fight or flight, am I going to use my viscera or am I going to use my muscles to survive? The muscles. So here's what happens. The hormones released by the adrenal glands cause the blood vessels in the viscera to squeeze and push the blood to the periphery where the muscles are so I can feed my muscles and get ready to run. And the issue about that is what was the function of the viscera? Growth. growth. But if I take the blood and send the, the blood from the viscera to the muscles, what happens to growth? It stops. Ah, under stress, you shut down your growth mechanism. Also, your immune system is a protection system, but the immune system doesn't protect you from lions. What does it protect you from? Bacteria and viruses, things that get under your skin. So the adrenal system is for protection against things in the environment that threaten you. The immune system is to protect you from things that get under your skin. So here's the point. If you're running away from a lion and you're in fight and flight, do you think you need the immune system? No. And in fact, because the immune system uses so much body energy, here's what happens. When the adrenal hormones get higher, it shuts off the immune system. As you get under stress, not only are you stopping your growth, but you're now shutting off your immune system. You find that at work or at school, when school comes to the end of the semester and everybody's under stress, that's when everybody starts getting sick. And the reason why is stress shuts off the immune system. It's so effective that medical doctors use the stress hormones to inhibit the immune system in people that they graft tissues and organs into. Why? I don't want them to reject the graft. So how do I stop them? Well, I want to shut off the immune system. I give them stress hormones. Well, if you're under stress, what are you doing to your own biology? You're opening yourself up for things to then come and attack you. And the last interesting aspect about it is simply this. When you're in fight or flight, are, are you going to use reflex behavior or are you going to use thinking and logic behavior to get out of the mess? Okay, why that's important? Because the hormones, remember I told you the hormones squeeze the blood vessels in the viscera and force the blood to the periphery? Well, the same hormones squeeze the blood vessels in the forebrain and push the blood to the hindbrain where reflex behavior comes from. Here's the point. Under stress, you are less intelligent. And you ought to know that if you've ever taken any school classes and you took that exam and you said, well, I know the, all the answers, right? And you sit down and you start doing the exam and you come to question number seven and you go, I don't know this one. And guess what? You can feel your body tingling. Why? Well, the first thing is you're getting blood in your arms and legs ready to run out of the classroom, <laughs> save your life. But then as you're doing this, you're realizing, I can't think of the answer. I can't think of the answer. So you say, okay, let me go to the next question. And that one's a simple one. You know what? You don't know the answer to that one. And the reason why, when you get under stress, you get ready for reflex behavior. Your conscious intelligence is reduced. So what does this mean in the world that we live in? Every time you turn on the news, every time you watch the TV, every time you listen to the radio, be afraid, be afraid, be afraid of this, be afraid of that. The air is bad, flesh-eating bacteria are coming. Think. So the bottom line is this. What do you think about your normal adrenaline levels in the population? They're so high, we're all under stress. People are getting sicker by the day, and we're getting less intelligent. So in conclusion, let me wrap it up and show you this. Here's the point. The body is like a camera for the following reason. Whatever the environmental signal is, it's picked up by the lens. So the camera sees something. The lens picks it up and translates it into the film where you make a complementary copy so that the camera always makes a complement of what is found in the environment. Well, the truth is, in biology, it's the same thing. The cell is like a camera. Whatever is in the environment, the membrane is like a lens. It picks up the image and sends that image to the nucleus where the database is. And that's where the stored images are. And the interesting aspect about it is this. The cell will make a physical structure to complement the environment. So that's if you're a diagnostician and you're looking at somebody's health, their physical expression is a reflection of the environment that they're in because they're making that mimic. So the bottom line is this. When you open your eyes, is this the image you see? The reason why, if you open your eyes and live in this stressful situation, what are you going to do to your physiology? Adrenaline, fight or flight, shut down growth, shut down the immune system, and be less intelligent. 
But you could easily look at the world and see a much better, healthier picture. For example, Maxfield Parrish's ecstasy, when you see this picture. So the question is, uh, I could see the world and see this, and what do you think I'm going to be in growth or protection? growth. So the bottom line is how I see it is adjusting who I am. Well, the interesting part about that is as follows. The perception interfaces between the environment and your biology, but your perception is belief. And therefore, beliefs act as a filter between the real environment and your biology. So your belief filters interfere if they're not accurate. If your beliefs are off, you're going to select genes that are inappropriate for the environment. So again, what keeps you in balance? Keeping your perception clear. So the bottom line is this. We actually end up with a filter between the environment and the camera, which is learned. We learn these filters. Before we were born, we were already learning. On the weekend course, I talk about conscious parenting. Many of your beliefs were already installed in you before you were born through the interaction of your mother and her perception of the environment because she was helping. Mothers and fathers are actually per, are genetic engineers. They are selecting genes in their offspring as they develop so the offspring fits the environment that the parents live in. Interesting point. Well, the question is this. We have filters. So, now you've got envelopes in your, in, that you came with. There's a red and green filter. Let's call these belief filters. And what I would like you to do is put one or the other filters in front of your eyes. Pick a red one or a green one, whatever one they got, and hold it up in front of your eyes and look at the screen. I'm going to ask you a question. and the que no, keep, Don't open them up if they're double. Keep them, keep them folded, okay? Here's, here you go. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. When you look at the picture, tell me if this is a picture of love or fear. When you see it, does it look like love or fear with your glasses on? Put the glasses on. Love. Are you living in love or are you living in fear? Love. Okay, now take the glasses off and find the other glasses. Okay, you got a different set of glasses now? Okay, put those up. You ready? Are you living in love or are you living in fear? Okay, are you living in love or are you living in fear? Love. Well, here's the simple point. This is the beautiful point. Life has everything in it. Life has everything, but you will only see what you have perception filters to see. And you were taught perception filters. You were taught by your parents. You were taught in school. You were taught how to see life. And here's the beautiful part. We can remove these filters that have interfered with our lives, and it does not take long. And the beautiful part is, after the break, when Rob Williams comes up here, he's going to show you and give you tools of how you can rapidly change your filter and, in the process, select healthier, more growth-satisfying genes than the ones that we tend to be selecting because of our concern about the environment. So the bottom line is this. You are all powerful. And the fact is, knowledge is power. With this knowledge, you have power over the unfoldment of your own life. You have power over which genes are going to be activated, which behaviors you're going to express. You are all powerful. You are not victims of genes. And the beautiful part about it is, all you have to understand is, what beliefs are you selecting genes with? And if they're not appropriate, you can change these beliefs. And this is the beautiful part about the second half of this program. Thank you very much for your attention on this. Thank you. Thank you very much.